Chinatown, in Boston, in Chicago, and in Washington, D.C. I grew up on Hudson Street. Everybody's father worked similar jobs. Everybody's mother sewed. This was the beginning of our journey to meet the American dream. The evolution and challenges of these unique American neighborhoods. They feel a belonging, and, and that's what we're trying to preserve. A Tale of Three Chinatowns on Local USA. Local USA was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, and the Wincote Foundation. Chinatown for me is a cultural touchstone. This is a place where my parents and grandparents came and lived when they first came to the United States. It's a group of folks that actually came here to settle and they were looking for a better life. I can connect with my heritage and my identity. Where newcomers to the country or to the neighborhood can go to have something they're familiar with. You can do business with people who understand the way you do business culturally. This is their, their spot, their place where they actually said, you know what, this is home. And if you've been to a Chinatown lately in a number of East Coast cities like New York or Boston or even Philadelphia, you might have noticed something. They're getting less, well, Chinese. I grew up on Hudson Street. I lived there from my birth. In my childhood, it was really like a village. It's a village model because you only had a limited number of Chinese immigrants. They were Tysonese rural people with kind of rural values. You could say it's brotherhood, but it's neighborliness, certain basic level of honesty and kind of helping each other and small. We played in the streets. Very easy to make jump ropes. On my street, there was one brother and sister who had a set of bikes. So we just took turns with the bikes and all toys were shared. I attended the Quincy School and we didn't speak English. The only person in the classroom who spoke English was the teacher. Everybody spoke Tysonese. All the children spoke Tysonese. You know, everybody knew everybody else. Everybody ate the same food. Everybody's father worked similar jobs. Everybody's mother sewed. We had a lot of freedom to go in and out of each other's houses. To me, it was Tyson paradise. When my father came to this country, the United States, he was about 18 years old. My father was a merchant who worked in Chicago. And you know, naturally, you bring your children. I came to this country at the age of 15 from uh, Guangdong. Came into here is different. Now everything is on my own. The biggest thing is loneliness. At those days, 1950, is uh, a lot of discrimination going on. And I, I used to write to my sister in China. Said, "Don't come to this country. It's very difficult." Very lonely. We lived right on 6th Street, 6th and 8th Street Northwest. We had a house, and we had basically three rooms, one for my parents, one for the girls, and one for three of us, the sons. My father, which who is uh, Ham H. Moy, he grew up in Alexandria, Virginia, and then when he graduated from high school, he was drafted in World War II. He met my mom from China and eventually got back to the United States. They came out here and lived in Chinatown with some relatives, and then eventually 
you wind up buying a house. Going from DC Chinatown was uh, very memorable only because we had a lot of our friends who lived very close by. Whenever we, we wanted to do something, we would just knock on the doors, run over to the house, and say we, we wanted to play football or basketball. We'd go to a certain park and just walk over there. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't have malls. We didn't have luxury cars that we kind of like enjoy the time we had together back then. Welcome. Tonight, we are proudly presenting our 14th annual Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month event. I'm John Abbott, President and CEO of GBH, and we are extremely proud to be in year 14, and the program gets more interesting and exciting every year. GBH, GBH World, and WTTW in Chicago that's a new wrinkle this year. We're very excited to be collaborating with our colleagues in Chicago. We have come together to present tonight's discussion on the vibrant past and uncertain future of Chinatowns in Boston and Chicago, as well as the new local AAPI affinity neighborhoods, such as Boston's Little Saigon. Thank you to our audience here in GBH, and we also welcome hundreds of viewers watching remotely from WTTW in Chicago, here in Boston, and from locations across our country in celebration of AAPI Heritage Month. Our commitment to showcasing content by and about the AAPI communities is evident year round. In May alone, GBH World will feature more than 50 films by and about Asian American and Pacific Islanders, including 10 original films that address issues about AAPI hate and the loss of lives and jobs due to COVID-19 to the fate of Chinatowns across the country. And I can't talk about the accomplishments of GBH World without saluting Liz Cheng, GBH's general manager, and the mastermind, the tireless mastermind of these events year in and year out. So World has become what World is because of Liz Cheng. And one fascinating film from our weekly series, America Reframed, Geographies of Kinship, debuts on GBH and on WTTW World. That's the way world works. GBH builds it, creates it, and then, thanks to Liz, communities in more than 75% of the country share the same channel and the same lineup committed to exploring diverse storytelling with diverse makers. Um, America Reframed Geographies of Kinship debuts on May 19th. It weaves together the complex lives of four adult adopt adopt adoptees uh, who were born in South Korea and who search for their heritage and history. We've also commissioned seven emerging AAPI filmmakers in partnership with ADOC to explore the challenges of immigration, COVID and violence against AAPI communities, as well as the joys of family, shared culture, and hopeful futures, some reflections of which you saw there in the clip. On May 23rd, we will present these Asian American stories of resilience and beyond in, in an event in partnership with the Boston Globe, the Center for Asian American Media, and the Boston, and the Boston Asian American Film Festival. We'll follow up with more information and about more events and films tomorrow via email so that we'll keep you posted so you didn't, in case you were pulling out a pencil and taking notes. <laughs> Don't worry, you're gonna get an email. I wanna thank those responsible for planning tonight's event, members of the GBH Board of Trustees, our Board of Advisors, the Advisors Council, and our Community uh, Advisory Board, and leaders in our community who have been wonderful partners, uh, supporters, counselors, and boosters of GBH's work. I also want to thank WTTW World for partnering with us on this event and amplifying a API content with their audiences in the greater Chicago area, also called Chicagoland, I'm told. Um, to get the evening started, it is my great pleasure to introduce Tim Russell from WTTW. Hello, I'm Tim Russell, VP of Community Engagement 
and diversity, equity, and inclusion at WTTW. And our purpose is to enrich lives, engage communities, and inspire exploration. WTTW is proud to co-produce tonight's AAPI event along with GBH World. Tonight, we will focus on the resilience of the AAPI community by examining what makes affinity neighborhoods survive and thrive. The story is unfolding daily as America evolves. People who were historically excluded are finding their power in coming together and building cultural centers. The documentary, A Tale of Three Chinatowns, examined the forces that are challenging Chinatowns in Chicago, Washington, D.C., and Boston. It features the voices of residents, community activists, developers, government officials, and others who are trying to preserve these neighborhoods. Here is an excerpt. Chinatowns have served as a sanctuary role from the 1850s onward with the anti-Chinese era. The Chinese at first were welcomed because of the need for cheap labor, but then they were harassed and had to gather back together. In numbers, we have greater level of protection. We have seen as historians looking back into this period of the 19th century that the term Chinatown gets used very loosely. Basically, if there's a cluster of Chinese seemingly residing in an, even a block um, or a street, it suddenly gets labeled as Chinatown. So the space itself becomes racialized as connected to Chinese people. But Chinatown itself isn't just simply because the Chinese chose to live there, it's also a process of racial segregation. It is partly created as a result of whites not wanting the Chinese to expand um, beyond a certain part of the city, and so definitely limiting their abilities to live or work. There were not just local laws, there were state laws that were anti-Chinese in flavor. In the 1860s and 70s, Chinese could not own property, Chinese could not intermarry. The Chinese by that time were in all kinds of activities, fisheries, farming, and they were working very well and working very hard and generally paid less. After the establishment of Chinatown in San Francisco, we actually saw the expansion of the Chinese community into the United States. And then they started going elsewhere and forming Chinatowns in Los Angeles, Seattle, Portland, as well as throughout the West and the Northwest. But we're met with violence, lynchings in old Los Angeles, Rock Springs, Wyoming massacre, the Snake River massacre, all this type of violence drove the Chinese out of these settlements where they had their own gold mines or their own fisheries. Where did they go? They were forced to go back to either larger Seattle Chinatown or San Francisco Chinatown. It's the context of why the Chinese were driven out of the West was that the very railroad they built brought Euro-American immigrants to the West. The Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 really marks the first time that Congress has ever named a national or ethnic group to be barred from immigration. This is a profound moment in the nation's history where it's clearly pointing to one group and saying, you are not welcome here. The fact that the US federal government has passed something like Chinese exclusion really sends a signal that the, the government is no longer there to protect Chinese. And there's a campaign against the Chinese. They're taking our jobs you know, white people should be working these jobs, and the Chinese were vilified. And they were physically driven out of small towns, and there's no place to go but to the cities and to the east, and that's the first settlers 
coming in around 1870. Chicago and New York were probably the main destinations, but then they went on to places like Boston and DC. My father came to this country when he was 13. My grandfather was already here running a laundry and they wanted to bring my father over. By 1944, he became of age, so he was drafted. My father served in the army and uh, actually we have a picture of his company. They were all white males except for my father and uh, one of his colleagues who were both Chinese and they were about a head shorter than everyone else. After World War II, and he went back and married my mother. They came here and lived in Chinatown. So I was born here in Boston. We lived on Hudson Street in a row house. It's basically a two-room apartment with the bathroom down the hall. Back when I was a kid, Chinatown was a really vibrant neighborhood, a residential community. There were two or three main streets, Hudson Street where we lived, Tyler Street, and then Harrison Avenue. And both sides of the street were these three-story tenement buildings, row houses, full of families. So we would just walk out the door and we would have friends to play with. And since we all went to the old Quincy School on Tyler Street, we're all classmates too, so we just knew everybody. My father initially worked in a hand laundry, and then he moved on to work in restaurants as a waiter. Most of my friends, their fathers were working in restaurants, and my mother and all, a lot of the other mothers worked in sewing factories as garment workers. Amazing film, and uh, don't forget it's premiering on World Channel on May 23rd. Um, my name is Liz Chang, General Manager for Television at GBH, and also for our national documentary service, World Channel. Uh, joining us today in a very exciting way is um, on the monitors our two filmmakers. Uh, first, Lisa, uh, first is uh, Penny Lee. She's a co producer and editor of A Tale of Three Chinatowns and works for network clients like the Discovery Channel. National Geographic and the Tra Travel Channel. And then next to her on the other monitor is uh, Lisa, Lisa Mao. Hi, Lisa, uh, who is the director, writer, and co-producer of A Tale of Three Chinatowns and the excerpt you just saw. She has created more than 500 hours of programming on platforms like the History Channel, National Geographic Channel, Animal Planet, and Investigation, Discovery, and more. Clearly, they worked on this film in their free time. Um, and of course, our third panelist, of course, is Andrew Leong, who you already saw in the film. And he is an associate professor in the philosophy department, legal studies, as well as Latinx and Asian American studies at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. And he serves as an advisor um, and also on camera for A Tale of Three Chinatowns. Clearly, he's a Renaissance man. So welcome, all of you. Uh, excited to get right in it. Um, despite your unflinching look at the past and future of Chinatowns, I definitely felt a great deal of affection for Chinatowns and for this film. And this was clearly a labor of love that you did in addition to your, to your daily work. Um, why was it important to make this film? Hi. Okay. Glad to be here. here. And, and can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Okay. okay. Um, um, it's important for me, I, just, just because, because I have a connection with Washington, D.C.'s Chinatown. Chinatown. I am a first generation resident when I when first came to the United, United States. States. My family lived in Washington, D.C. So the community of D.C.'s Chinatown, Chinatown is very dear, dear to my heart. Uh, I've met many friends, friends lifelong friends, friends, friends there. there. I met my husband there, there. got married, uh, had a Chinese bank right in the restaurants there. there. And as, and as over the years, years, things have changed in, in our community. community. And, and every time we get together, together with friends, friends whether in weddings or funerals, we talk about what life was Chinatown, what life in Chinatown was like. So those stories are just precious to me. And so preserving stories is important in preserving history. I mean, it's like, what is the next generation going to know if you don't share these stories with people? 
and preserve these stories. And so our film is a way that we can bring these stories in light and sharing it with the public from, you know, different cities and different experiences that people have experienced and lived in these Chinatowns. And that's why in our film, um, we've interviewed, well, over 40 people. And um, we decided not to use a narrator because the voices of our subjects are very important. So we try to allow um, our subjects to tell their stories and to share those stories. So again, going back to why we did this film, preserving story, preserving history is important. Excellent, and and certainly makes a lot of sense, uh, and and adds to that authenticity to have actual people's voices as opposed to a voice of God. And Lisa, how about you? Why was this important? This film important for you? Yeah, yeah. Um, Liz, thank you for having us. Um, we're so honored that uh, you know we're, we're doing this event um, again. Just you know, it's wonderful. Thank you again. Um, so for me, my connection to Chinatown is not as close as Penny's is. Uh, my immigrant story, my family story, is is just a different pathway. Um, for me, I didn't really um, go to Chinatown often when I was a kid. We maybe like went five times in my life as a child. It was a special place that my parents wanted to expose us to Chinese culture and food. Um, and when I was a, a child, but again, like we didn't go that often. Um, for me, you know, I would say that you know I felt like these stories were very important to echo what Penny said, because, you know, we can't lose these stories. I mean, I think that this film obviously is about gentrification and in a way that's the erasing of a culture from a location. And for me, you know, Penny and I worked together on another film called Through Chinatown's Eyes, April, 1968. And through that experience, you know, it was very obvious, like, wow, you know, DC's Chinatown, um, it's a, it's a, shadow of itself. Um, and so really, um, through that experience, it felt like, wow, we need to amplify voices, um, just amplify voices of those who who are there um, and in the shadows and who need a platform to be heard. So for me, that was really my motivation to do this film. And so why Boston, Chicago, and D.C.? It's fascinating uh, the way that you weave their stories, but specifically, why did you choose those three cities? Yeah, so um, so after we did the Through Chinatown's Eyes film, um, you know, we kept thinking to ourselves, what can we do next? And, you know, honestly, in screenings, people would ask us, what are we doing next? So it just felt like a natural progression for us to look at gentrification. You know, what happened after 1968? How did that perhaps affect DC's Chinatown? And, you know, we landed on gentrification. And then in looking at that story, we thought, you know, well, we can't really look at this in a vacuum where else can we go? And we, we heard, you know, whispers and also saw them ourselves that, you know, chi you know, Chinatowns and other cities were also changing. So it felt like, wow, okay, like we should look at this issue because clearly it's happening everywhere. And also not just to Chinatowns, but to other affinity neighborhoods. Um, and so we ended up landing on DC, obviously, because we have this connection here and DC's uh, current state is so extreme in terms of what happened to its Chinatown. Um, and then in our research, um, you know, we met Dr. Leong, who, you know, in talking to Andrew, he, he's one who shared with us, actually, Chicago's is growing. And I was like, what? That's incredible. Um, so we explored that. And then in the end, Boston, you know, Penny, through her work with the CCBA, had had a lot of connection to Boston and had shared with me that, look, there's a lot of activism happening there. Um, you know, and, and the, the, the uh, you know, sort of the pressures, you know, the players, it seemed like a very diverse mix of, of you know, of issues. Um, so Boston just, it was like a natural, a natural uh, third city. Well, it's definitely a cautionary tale. We were able to, um, through my, our networks, through my friends in Boston, we, have, we got introduced to Andrew, and then Andrew became our advisor. And we've learned so much from him. Yeah. And so we're grateful to have him on board for our team. And, and as you say, it's definitely a cautionary tale as I, as I was watching the film when we first started talking, oh gosh, about a year ago. And, um, and it's fascinating in that way. You have DC, which has pretty much uh, no Chinatown. 
You have Chicago, which is an enormously growing Chinatown of almost 30 blocks. And then you have Boston, which is in a crossroads. It seems like it could go either way. And, and Andrew, I think you, you sort of talk about that. What, what are those, some of those challenges that, that Boston has to face and other Chinatowns, and even Chicago now, even though it's success? But there are, there are so many challenges still. Well, I mean, uh, D.C. is the model as to where we don't want Chinatowns to become. You know, what I have termed the dizzyfication of Chinatowns that is really a place simply for tourists. Uh, where it's lacking in its residential component, there's no small businesses, uh, and that's the threat for, for Boston and or Chicago. For Boston specifically, you know, we face a lot more pressures from development. So if you, you know, obviously if you folks go down to Boston Chinatown, you can see the skyscrapers coming in. Uh, which were, you know, which was actually some of the, uh, the, the goal that a former BRA director did not want. You know, these huge uh, skyscrapers that would create this wind tunnel effect, you know, uh, that Stephen Coyle talked about, you know, on, on Lower Washington Street. Yet, there it is right now. Uh, and so that's the threat that, that we have, that because uh, the small-time landlords in Chinatown see the changes that's happening within uh, Lower Washington Street and uh, around Chinatown, they, do, they too want a piece of the pie. And so what they wind up doing is to probably displace their tenants, gut the units in order to jack up the, the rent. And so that's the kind of uh, um, threat that we might see in Chicago. It's amazing seeing in the film that map that at one time, following the um, route of the transatlantic railroad construction, there used to be 18 or more robust Chinatowns in places like Deadwood, South Dakota. We know about that because of the HBO series, Rock Springs, Wyoming, uh, 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 Omaha, Nebraska. But after 1880, so many of these Chinatowns disappeared. Um, and, and maybe that's sort of at the root of what is the issue around these Chinatowns, because they started off as a place that they put Chinese people because they didn't, or at the back then, or AAPI, because they didn't want them mixing. So if you could talk a little bit about the history that was described. In yeah, that. and unfortunately, we had to cut... Uh... <laughs> This, I know this is killing us, right? About like you know, 30 minutes or 40 minutes of anti-Asian violence history from the 19th century, you know, off the, the film. Um, maybe that should be a different documentary, you guys. Yeah, yeah. But, but that really shows the kind of pressures that we were experiencing as, uh, as a Chinese American and eventually an Asian American community. Because all those particular communities weren't necessarily within an urban city area like San Francisco or even Seattle, right? Uh, we're talking about Deadwood. We're talking about uh, back then Denver, Colorado, all these places. And that, that tells you, that informs you that at one point in time, the Chinese had the freedom of mobility until the waves of anti-Chinese sentiments happen, right? Starting from the 60s, 70s, 80s onward, culminating uh, with the passage of the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, which we really was not the first exclusion act uh, against you know, a particular racialized group. Uh, that was one of the things that you know, we you know, didn't, didn't have a chance to really correct. It's the 1875 Page Act that really forbade Japanese, Chinese, Mongolian women. And so it started there, but that's a national proposal and, and a proposal, I mean a bill, right? But you know, it started way back in California. All these various different states, very, very similar to what we are experiencing right now. And so when, the, when those waves of anti-Chinese sentiment happened, that, that began to cause all the various different massacres that we saw. And we were only able to sneak in a few of them, whereas if you do your research online, you will find you know, one after another. Uh, and, and those particular communities just totally disappeared. They were wiped out, they were lynched, they were burnt. Uh, and, and it began to push some of these other, uh, the Chinese community, you know, to the West and to the Midwest. Uh, and, and then we saw a different wave of, you know, anti-Chinese sentiment through urban renewal. So, for instance, you know, one of the um, cities that was highlighted was St. Louis, 
Uh, and they had a Chinatown from, what, 1869 until urban renewal, the 1960s, when, when Bush Stadium came in. And so this is how we go about defining anti-Asian violence, right, that, that, you know, that impacts our community. It's not just through individual, you know, acts of killing, but it is redlining, it is the various, you know, it's Japanese American internment. It is the, you know, uh, the Red Scare during the 50s, you know, building all the way up to the present. So it's fascinating what began um, and oftentimes as a negative thing, i.e. being segregated outside of the community, that Chinese Americans and AAPI Americans and affinity neighborhoods today have turned that into a positive. It's that sort of self-segregation in a way that some people talk about, but it's become a haven oftentimes for people. And so it, it, we find that, you know, especially new immigrants, when they come to uh, our various communities, they like these communities because they know the language, because they know the culture. And there are also services that help them. And, you know, it, we'd be remiss in not um, talking about Chicago Chinatown and their success, which was based on being kind of kicked out of town. And then they turn that again from a negative into a positive. So if we could roll that, uh, that next film, which is um, founder of Chicago Dragons Athletic Association, so it's from the clip, Gene Lee, described how Chicago's Chinatown was forced to move from its original location. He's followed by Chicago panelist Ernest C. Wong, former chair of the Chinese American Services League, who worked on many landscape design projects in Chicago's Chinatown, and Dr. Lisa Yun Kin Lee, I'm sorry, Lisa Yun Lee, executive director of the National Public Housing Museum. So let's take a look. I'm going to give you a little story about this Chinatown. 107 years at Sir Mac and Wentworth. Back in 1912, before we moved to this location, we were at Clark and Van Buren, South Loop. Our business people were not able to extend their leases, buy property, do upgrades. What's going on? Well, what's going on was that we were not at the table. We had no voice. We had no input in regards to our future or our issues, our needs. The planners, the people that had the power, wanted to expand downtown. We were not part of that plan. So we were looking around and we found this area, Sir Mac and Wentworth, which is why we have 107 years. How does that relate to politics? Everything revolves around politics. So Chicago's Chinatown was interesting after uh, they had moved from basically the South Loop downtown area into predominantly a Irish-Italian neighborhood on the south side, uh, 22nd, uh, 22nd Street. Uh, and this was really pretty much an undesirable part of town at that time uh, in, in the uh, early 1900s. Um, but it wasn't until really the 1950s that things started to really develop a lot more. Uh, the businesses were flourishing. Um, more and more Chinese continued to move to Chicago. And, and that was really an interesting time uh, because even though they were trying to gain more and more tourism, uh, particularly with Chinese food, in the 1970s um, and 80s, uh, the growth of Chinatown continued to expand. And so people like, uh, uh, Chinatown leaders such as Ping Tom and John Tan uh, and Raymond Lee, uh, some of these early pioneers really had banded together and started to, uh, to uh, basically lobby a lot of the politicians in investing more infrastructure and more uh, uh, desirable city services into Chicago's Chinatown. And that kind of evolved into this new Chinatown, which they call Chinatown Square. In the early 1900s, the move allowed for a vibrant community center and a variety of organizations for mutual support and aid. 
The Chicago affiliate of the National Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association was founded, and it quickly became the largest organizational force in Chicago's Chinese community. In the face of government neglect and discrimination, Chinese mutual aid groups provided social services, arbitrated disputes without the Chicago police to create real public safety, came together to provide economic safety nets, and cared for one another. Mutual aid was for the Chinese, as it is now, a radical act of caring for each other while working to change the world. Looking back to Chicago's Chinatown history can teach us much about how to organize mutual aid. So, so Lisa and Penny, uh, it seems to me that when you just when you were doing this film, that you discovered a lot of positives. You know, you have the negative DC. I used to go to DC all the time when I was a kid, and not a single restaurant uh, or store or any of the places we used to go to are left. Um, so clearly, Chicago had a lot going for it. So if you could talk about uh, places like San Francisco, where that political activism really worked, but what specifically around Chicago really kind of came together to make this a positive story? Uh, there's so many aspects of it. I mean, I think, um, you know, to me, what really struck me in making the film was all of the activism that was happening from the grassroots level. I mean, really, Raymond Lee, his story to me was really incredible. I read his book, and in his interview, he talked about Ping Tom, who, you know, as we know from the film, Ping Tom passed away um, several years ago. But, you know, Ping Tom and his his, his civic duty, you know, this this feeling of, like, giving back and, and giving back to the community. Like, you can't just come in here, make money, and then just take off. What are you going to do for the community? What will you do for us? And, you know, I think for Raymond Lee, you know, through his friendship with Kim Tan and others, um, it, he, he got involved. You know, he was a successful, is a successful businessman, um, and he, he gave back um, by by buying the building that he he lived in as a child and worked in, and now has turned into a museum. Um, so I, I feel like, to me, like that kind of giving back was was really powerful because it wasn't just obviously Raymond Lee; it was Ping Tom and a number of of people. Um, you know, I think even you know stories like June Coutre, uh, who didn't even grow up in Chinatown, right? But her parents lived there uh, when she was herself was having a family. You know, she thought, "Wow, well." I want my child to know her her parent, you know, to, to know you know her own, you know, her grandparents and her culture. Um, let's let's move there, right? And so to me, that was really powerful. Um, the, what blew me away also was that you know today there's a group that is trying to get a high school in the area, which I thought was incredible. And Penny, yeah, uh, conversely, what Lisa said, um, community activism and. For example, Gene Lee, he is the founder of the Chicago Chinatown Special Events. And they're the people that host the Lunar New Year parades. But not only that, they do summer festivals, quite a few of them throughout the year, I believe. And this, these events bring people together, what near or far, and they have them often. And... Um, you know, listening to the community people doing things in, in Chinatowns, it's just um, an amazing um, give back. And I, I've learned so much from that. And I'm hoping that in DC, we can start, you know, begin to have a lot more of community activism, ad advocacy, and, um, and things like that for us as well. It's also great to know that, you know, Jean's uh, daughter is now the city council person repre representing Chinatown. Right, so important. So, you know, yeah. it's, it is about, you know, making sure that, you know, we keep those lines of history of representation, advocacy, you know, f for the community alive. Otherwise, public policymakers are not going to listen to us. As Jean said, uh, a seat at the table. What also sort of strikes me, what, what Andrew, you had talked about also, and, and certainly Penny, you know about, that in D.C., what ended up happening, people um, who are of Chinese descent ended up selling their places basically to the highest bidder uh, and, and moving out. And therefore, all those kinds of touchstones went away, whereas in Chicago, something else completely was happening. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, Chicago is very, very personal to me as well in the, in the same manner as Penny because I immigrated 
Uh, my, my grandfather picked me up from O'Hare, and we, we uh, went back to Wentworth, right? Uh, and that's where I live, you know, in, in Chinatown. And so, you know, and he was the, the chair of the An Leung for many, many years, and he could tell you all these particular stories that, you know, the police, the cops, they're not going to ticket us. Why? Because, you know, we, we talked to City Hall, right? And so even back in those particular days when we really didn't have any Asian American representation, there are still inroads. But you need to make sure that, you know, there are those particular roads, those avenues for advocacy. And moving ahead now, uh, the, the biggest threat to Chicago is, in fact, the kind of massive uh, uh, gentrification that we see because, you know, two blocks north of Chinatown is this new development called the 78 that is going to bring in 10,000 units of housing. Precisely. So, um, you know, I can't believe how quickly the, the time has gone. Um, we didn't get a chance to get to the questions, but Nam Pham, the, your question about gentrification will be handled by our friend Daniel Kim uh, next up. So um, I wanted to thank you, all three of you, our filmmakers. Thank you so much for doing this incredible film that you, and sharing it with the world and all of us. And, of course, Andrew Leong, your, your insightful uh, comments about, you know, our future and past of Chinatown, just so important. Um, and, you know, thank you so much uh, to all three of you for joining us. And uh, we have our next clip up, which um, really talks about the, um, you know, the you know, what, what is happening and sort of sets up what happened in Chicago, what were the positives, but also, as, as Andrew will point out, um, what are the same kinds of concerns around gentrification that are happening in Chicago today? Because, interesting, that property is now very, very popular. So let's take a look at that clip, and then we can set up for our next panel. Thanks, Liz. Thank you. They have attractive spaces, a park. They have a water view, as well as highway access. Chicago Chinatown is also located on a transit line. All those particular features that we're seeing the demise out of the traditional older Chinatowns across the rest of the country, those are the kind of danger signs, the, the warnings that uh, the, the, the residents and the leaders within Chicago Chinatown needs to be aware of and to make sure that uh, policymakers address, you know, to preserve, to make sure that this community exists into the future. It, it is becoming very popular, and the proximity to downtown uh, Chicago continues, gets, gets closer and closer as downtown continues to expand uh, south towards Chinatown. There is now a new development uh, called the 78, which is um, slated to become the new great development uh, within Chicago. Um, and this is by the same developer that did Hudson Yards in New York uh, and, and were so successful. But along with that comes some of the problems uh, and challenges of possible gentrification of Chinatown. And there are a lot of people who are very concerned about that. Um, you know, I talked earlier a little bit about um, the great architecture and the architecture that is making Chinatown so fantastic in the